Cruz, I actually saw this floating around on the subreddit. Uh, a few people pointed this out, that there was this article that nobody noticed for almost a month, posted September 10th, uh, related to Guild Wars 2 news. However, it looked a little odd because um, it said, uh, you know, there's the, the name of the person who wrote the article, um, and it says that they talked to Arena Net, but it doesn't mention who they talked to at all. Um, now, fortunately, I am a, a potato of medium importance, and I was able to contact uh, Bobby Stein at Arena Net, and I was like, hey, uh, I just wanted to fact check this, as I do not like spreading misinformation, and I wanted to find out if this was real before I possibly talked about it. And he checked, and it was like, yes, yes, this is real. It turns out they interviewed Grouch. And uh, so, you know, Josh was the one who did this interview that for some silly reason they didn't include it on the webpage. So it has been fact checked. It is the real deal. And let's talk about what uh, they talked about a month ago because there was a, I skimmed it. There was some interesting stuff. And so here we are today. And as always, there will be a link down below if you just want to uh, read that. So uh, going down, it says ArenaNet continues to stay relatively successful in Guild Wars 2. Uh, speaking of just a second, I need to update... There we go. I had to update the category. With a solid launch of its recently released expansion, Janthier Wilds. Despite implementing new ideas in the existing sandbox, the new expansion fits right in alongside the massive world of Tyria. As an avid player myself, Guild Wars 2 has given me so much throughout the years that I cannot wait to see what is next for the Commander slash Wayfinder. Just to give an idea of where I come from, I've been a regular Guild Wars 2 player since the Path of Fire expansion. Living World Season 4 changed how I look at storytelling in video games. Uh, pausing there real quick, I, I have said many times that uh, Living World Season 4, it, for me, is my favorite chunk of the story of Guild Wars 2. Like, if you if you just play through the whole you know single-player story uh, from the beginning all the way up to today, uh, Living World Season 4 had amazing, amazing writing. They had some really inspired ideas there. Um, for me, the idea of facing defeat as the main characters in a story hit differently at the time, and ever since, I have always benchmarked a live service story based on the ending of that specific living world season. Recently, I had the opportunity to ask a few questions to the terrific minds behind the masterpiece. In a conversation with Sportskida, which is the name of this website, uh, ArenaNet opened up about some of the future aspects the developers have been planning for the game, alongside reflecting on a few things that are present in the current sandbox. Uh, and again, this is a conversa conversation between um, Sportskida, this website, uh, and their journalist, and Grouch, uh, a.k.a. Josh. Uh, ArenaNet opens up about Guild Wars 2's future, thoughts on current meta, and more. Question. Elite specializations have been re really integral to professions since their introduction in Heart of Thorns. Having opted to not release more for the last two expansions, what are your plans going forward to continue expanding on build potential? Uh, so really quick for anyone just new to the game. Elite specializations were added in uh, Heart of Thorns, Path of Fire, and End of Dragons. So, for example, Engineers, they got Scrapper, and then they got Hollowsmith, and then they got Mechanist, which are entirely different ways of playing the game. Um, in uh, Secrets of the Obscure and Janthir Wilds, uh, they got different things that affected how they could do builds. They got Weapon Master specializations, so they could use like the me Mechanist Mace while they're playing a Scrapper, uh, and they got the new expanded weapon proficiencies. So, uh, Engineers got the Shortbow. Um, and then in End of Dragons, everyone got Spear, uh, which gave them you know, some, some new ways of making some builds. So this is basically saying, uh, what are you going to do to give us more builds in the future? Answer, it is a little early to talk about plans for our next expansion, but we're leaving our options open. Like the new weapon and relic options we've introduced over the last two expansions, whatever we do next will be focused on giving players t new tools and ways to battle. Um, so he's being intentionally vague there. So this... Basically, you know, they're making an expansion every year. I am positive that they already have a loose framework at the minimum of the, what the next expansion is going to be. You know, they they're at you know t minus eleven months or something before it comes out. So they're already in the planning stages. Um, it is possible that they do not yet have um, a final version of their idea for new builds in the next expansion. Uh, it is also possible that they do have an idea, but they don't want to share it yet. So those are, in my opinion, the top two things that could be. Uh, question. At this stage in the game's life, there's a real abundance of higher difficulty content, namely raids and strikes. Does the development team currently have a primary focus between these two, or is there maybe a more broad viewpoint on the subject entirely? Answer. Strikes have been our go-to over the last few years, and we have seen some good success with them. Uh, once again, uh, I, I want to make sure everyone watching this can feel included in the conversation. Uh, strikes are 10-man content that typically you zone in, there's a boss fight, you get it done, you zone out. 
There's no trash mobs. There's very little story. Uh, there's a little, but, you know, it's just go in, fight, get out. Um, it, they were a replacement uh, for raids in the content that came out. Uh, Strikes came out in um, Icebridge Saga and in End of Dragons and in Secrets of the Obscure. And in all of those, no raids were added. So they were the 10-man instanced content that was added in those um, chunks of content uh, in, in those expansions. Um, in, in the case of Iceford Saga, not an expansion, but you know, basically a uh, free LC. So the strikes, uh, they had said originally were meant to be kind of like training wheels or stepping stones to get into raids. Uh, that's why whenever you see someone doing a strike mission that asks for like, you know, 50 LI, they're absolutely insane. So you do strikes, you get good, and then you go into raids, which is the original idea. But then they came up with the idea of adding challenge modes to strikes in Soto. So now there's like strikes, and then there's like raids, and then there's like challenge mode strikes. They're way up there. So, you know, then we had some like really cool moments, like the world first uh, run to kill Ceres, which took many days. It was a very, very challenging fight. Um, end game PvE folks have been looking forward to a new raid for years. And when the opportunity arose, we knew we had to jump on it. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. I think I skipped a sentence. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. Uh, development a way that allowed us to commit to building a new raid wing, something that simply wasn't an option for us during EOD or SOTO development. End game PvE folks have been looking forward to a new raid for years, and when the opportunity arose, we knew we had to jump on it. It helped that we had a lot of raid and strike players on the dev team who were advocating for it, too. Uh, and yes, because they spent so many years releasing strikes, it had been many years since the last raid came out. Uh, now, raids in Guild Wars 2 are special because um, in Guild Wars 2, they never raise the maximum level. So all max level content stays relevant. There are still people today that get full raid groups and go and do every raid that has ever been released. Uh, so it kind of becomes evergreen content. Player feedback has been essential in guiding our approach, and the community's response to the new raid will heavily influence our future decisions. Aspirational PvE content like raids plays an important role in the game, but it's not exactly a secret that it's fairly niche compared to other play uh, other areas like story, open world PvE, fractals, world v. world, and even structured player versus player. In an ideal world, we do all the things, but the reality is that we're a smaller, scrappy dev team compared to our competitors, and we have to be very judicious in terms of what we choose to build. We're constantly evaluating the opportunity cost of developing a feature or a piece of content versus another. Outside, uh, you know, just to pause there, one thing I like about um, that is their whole new idea, which they started doing in End of Dragons, is like, you, know, you go through the story, and then there's the part of the story, for example, where you fight uh, you know, the, the Kanang Overlook part. And that is a part of the story. It is also later a strike mission, and it is also a challenge mode strike mission. So they found a way that I don't think is scummy or anything to get three pieces of content out of that one thing they made. And granted, you know, they had to tweak the numbers and stuff, but a lot of the work, like when they made it for the story, like 90% of the work was done to make it into the 10-man strike and then the 10-man challenge mode. It was basically just like add another ability or two, tweak the numbers, remove the guardrails. You know, 90% of the work was done. So I think they've got a pretty good formula for getting a lot of bang for their buck with their development time with their current formula. Um, outside of new endgame PvE content, we'd like to continue breaking down the barriers to endgame PvE so that more players can enjoy it. There's a lot of amazing content there for players to experience, but getting your foot in the door as a new player is really intimidating and even confusing. Uh, unless you go to Muckluck Labs and watch my guides. We've taken some steps toward addressing this in recent years as part of our increased attention to quality of life improvements, but we have a long to-do list on the systems side that will hit as time allows. Um, okay. Uh, pretty much any combat in the current Guild Wars 2 meta sees 100% alacrity and quickness uptime as necessities. Uh, so for new players, quickness is a buff that makes all your actions occur faster. So anything with a cast bar will happen more quickly. And alacrity is something that reduces your cooldowns. So if something would have a 60 second cooldown and you have alacrity, it will be available again in like 48 seconds. So most groups will you know form to, in order to have quickness and alacrity up at all times on the party uh they'll kind of they'll be like you know, do you have quickness covered yes do you have qu alacrity covered yes and then usually without a lot of effort you'll have 25 stacks of might and fury and regen and protection and swiftness also because those are easier to acquire uh as long as those quickness and alacrity are covered now it does feel good having those buffs on you but it has become kind of the 
the basic, like the bare minimum for groups over the years. Um, there was a lot more freedom to kind of do whatever, you know, uh, in Guild Wars 2 before those boons were added. And now it's just like, people are so used to playing with them that it kind of feels like you're playing while, you know, in molasses if you don't have them. You just, you feel so slow. Uh, even in meta events nowadays, leaders will organize five-man groups to have both whenever possible. As an alacrity build main myself, I wonder what your perspective or opinions are on this meta and if you've considered trying to alter it. Um, uh, before reading their answer, uh, I, I myself, but I would love if they were gone. Now, I, first of all, I, I would say that if, you, they, if they were just gone like instantly, we would probably need to change something. Like, uh, it just quickness is so strong. Like... World of Warcraft has the Bloodlust buff, which is like a 20 or 30% speed increase. And it's like for 45 seconds with a 10 minute cooldown. Uh, last I played, which was years ago, it might have changed. Um, quickness is more than that, and it's just permanent. It is busted. It is absolutely insane. Like, I would be fine if they just baked like half of it into all of us baseline and then just removed the thing, because it is absolutely insane. Uh, but that's just my opinion. And, you know, I don't control how the game is developed. So if you don't agree with me, fear not. Uh, I, I have no power there. Um, we've discussed the significant role boons like quickness and alacrity play in combat and how integral they become. It's a complex topic with a lot of layers. I might catch some flack for the following hot take, but knowing what I do, uh, what I know now, if I could go back in time to 2015 and prevent quickness from becoming a boon and alacrity from being out of the game, I probably would. Thank you. Uh, it feels good that they, uh, that they have the same opinion, but, uh, you know, he's not saying he's going to remove it, but he's saying, I wish I had never made it. So yeah, it, it's become a problem. So, uh, some, some examples of problems that it's made you guys. So we've got max level content such as Gorsival, which people are, feel like if they ever have to do the gliding mechanic, which is part of the fight, that they're in a bad group. Because the baseline, the current modern baseline for damage is so high that people are used to skipping phases on him. Harvest Temple Challenge Mode, which is the same level content. If you go in there with the same boons and people, it's insanely tough. So like if you nerf boons to make it to where Gorsival is done properly again, Harvest Temple may become impossible. Because they made... Harvest Temple CM and Old Lion's Court CM and Sarah CM with the maximum of what a current day player can do in mind. But back when Heart of Thorns came out and these other bosses were added, just our, our output was so much lower. Like damage creep, power creep has been a huge thing, a very real thing. Um, I don't know what I'd say that, the, uh, that I don't know that I'd say that they were bad changes, but they certainly caused a fundamental shift in combat feel and encounter meta, uh, especially compared to the vanilla Guild Wars 2 experience. We could probably make some big changes here that would make for a better game from a game design and system standpoint, but I don't know that they would make the game more fun, if that makes sense. And it turns out that the game being fun is pretty important. <laughs> uh, those boons were added nine years ago, and most players have grown accustomed to having 100% uptime. Slowing combat down, or worse, making the improved recharge and cast spells b speeds baseline would be very contentious. This isn't to say that we won't experiment on this front, but we don't currently have any major reworks in the hopper. I, and again, I would love if they just like got rid of alacrity and then just reduce the cooldowns of everything by 20% and or 10 maybe 10% kind of go halfsies on it. But I also can't currently trust them to do that. I don't know how many of you guys also main a class where they took away your reduce all cooldown of such and such skill type by 20% and then they said they were going to bake it into those skills and then they didn't. Ranger main here, uh when they re re removed the trait that reduced the cooldown of all wilderness survival skills by 20%, they didn't add that cooldown reduction to all wilderness survival skills. Uh, when they re removed the minus 20% cooldown to all trap skills uh, trait, they did not bake it into all trap skills. They did like half of them. And so it's just like, you know, I would love for them to do that thing I mentioned, but I, I can't currently trust that they would. All right. Uh, but the, but the, but the, but the, but the. We've been seeing a new release cadence for expansion since Secrets, with only a year gap between each. Is there any chance we'll see a return to the original multi-year time gap with living world seasons in between? Um, I'm imagining no. I have a hard time imagining a scenario where we'd return to the old ways, especially given how much success we've seen with annual expansions. This cadence not only supports a sustainable dev cycle, but also allows us to bring exciting varied content to players more frequently. 
Um, and I think that's a good thing. Like, I I absolutely think that Path of Fire is a whole lot better than Soto or Janthier on their own. But Path of Fire was, you know, they spent years making that, right? And then after Path of Fire, um, it, the game was so good that even though we thought that the game was on life support and there was no new expansions for like, what, five years? It still had a very active player base because the, uh, the game was so good. Um, that said, though, uh, you know, the, there was, that, during that time period, if something was OP, it would be OP for six months before we got a patch that fixed it. If something was broken, it stayed broken for like a minimum of six months before they fixed it because patches were so rare. So I don't miss that. I do. I don't miss that part. You know, if you if you're gonna think, like put on rose colored glasses and just be like, oh, I miss those those huge expansions. Think about all the time that we were waiting on like patches and fixes too. And you know, we still do to an extent, but it's it's better now than it was in that regard, in my opinion. Uh, PvP has always been a significant part of Guild Wars 2, with many even considering World v. World to be the true endgame content. It's also no secret that the highest-end competitors are on a level of their own, making the skill curve extremely steep. Thank you. Is there anything you can tell us about the new PvP game mode that was announced in June? Poosh! And are there any intentions of using this to make PvP more accessible to less seasoned players? I mean, they've already said that they're trying to. Uh, the new push PvP game mode is designed to make PvP more accessible while still delivering a competitive and engaging experience. Nerf wheel benders. But push simplifies the objectives compared to conquest by focusing on one central goal, moving the objective toward the enemy base while preventing them from doing the same. This change offers a more intuitive introduction to PvP for new players, who may have found conquest complexity overwhelming, but still provides the depth and teamwork that experienced PvPers thrive on. By hosting a, be a beta event that started on September 10th, again, remember this uh, this interview was like a month ago, uh, we're involving the community in the development process to ensure it resonates with both casual players and veterans. Our hope is that push will bridge the gap between newcomers and seasoned players, offering a fast-paced, fun experience that eases the learning curve without compromising on competitive intensity. Um, I think they did a good job with push. Um, just to, I, I've got a whole video where I talk about this, so just super TLDR. I think push was good. I think it was fun. And if you like team fights, you're going to love push because it forces a nonstop constant team fight. Downside, any problems with like this this build is OP, this class is OP, this guy one shot me, this guy kills me in one second out of stealth, that's still there. That's that's not going gone anywhere just because push was made. So I've had some you know games of push that were really fun and they were back and forth and it went all the way to the until the timer ran out and I lost and I had an absolute blast. I've had other games where they basically just one shot our entire one shot our entire team and then just ended it in like 60 seconds multiple times. I've had games where I, my team one shot theirs in 60 seconds and we ended it and it, those aren't fun. You know the, the stomps aren't fun. Um so push I think is good but matchmaking and balance still need to be addressed. Um, and I did a recent video that was called like what I would fix if I controlled PvP or something like that, where I talked about all these thoughts there, if you care. Um, okay, Guild Wars 2 has always had a great new player experience, managing to introduce its plethora of content at a digestible pace, while still allowing for player agency and exploration. Is there any chance we'll see the game available on other clients to attract even more new players to Tyria? Um, depends what they mean by clients. If by other clients you mean console, it's unlikely. It, uh, it comes up internally every now and then, and we've done due diligence on the matter, but the level of effort required to port the game to the console is immense from both the development and gameplay perspective. Uh, I'd rather keep our team and resources focused on serving our players. Um, I will say it works on Steam Deck. Um, I think Bobby Stein from ArenaNet has posted, like, uh, screenshots of his character. That he's got a max level character that's called, like, Bobby on Steam Deck or something. And he, he plays it, and it, it, I know it works there. Um, yeah, a reminder that they had to basically give up on supporting, uh, the game just on Apple computers. Because, um, you know, Mac just kept changing, like, the, uh, the setup. And they were having to devote an entire team to it. And, you know, it would be a similar situation with the console. Uh, while the console isn't on the horizon, we remain committed to expanding our presence on PC platforms to welcome even more players to Tyria. In fact, we're actively preparing to launch on the Epic Games Store platform in the very near future. That's cool. Good for them. I know many, I know many, many people that watch me hate Epic Games, but it's good for them. If you love the game, be happy for them that they're going to have more eyes on their game. That's actually good for them. Uh, we don't have any plans to announce beyond that, but we're always looking out for opportunities to grow the community. 
Uh, yeah, I, I'll say that, like, when Guild Wars 2 launched on Steam, obviously Steam is bigger than Epic, but they got a huge influx of new players. Like, I'm, I'm actually able to see that because I have so many guides for new players. I see when another wave of people hit them, and the Steam one was, was, it was quite a wave. So, you know, Epic would bring in more. Not as many, sure, but it would bring in more. Uh, Guild Wars 2 has always been a game that thrives on cooperation and group play. Whether you're wandering in the open world or doing organized meta events, you'll almost always end up tagging along with those around you in some capacity. The in-game group finder can often leave players feeling the need to use third-party tools, such as Discord and Reddit, to find a party or guild. Have there been any discussions internally about this? And if so, does the team intend to update or expand on this system? Uh, Answer. We've always emphasized cooperation community-driven experiences as core pillars of Guild Wars 2. Whether through open-world events or large-scale metas, our goal is to create a world where players naturally come together to accomplish uh, shared objectives. While the in-game group finder has helped new players connect in these moments, we're aware that some players turn to third-party tools like Discord or Reddit to find more specialized groups or build long-term connections with guilds and communities. Internally, we've had ongoing discussions about how to evolve our systems to meet the needs of a modern MMO community, especially as players and expectations and technology have advanced. Improving accessibility and ease of use for our group system is something we're constantly considering and aligns with our new development strategy that puts increased attention towards improving or revamping legacy systems. Uh, see the Wizard's Vault in Homesteads. We're looking, for, uh, we're looking into ways to better integrate these systems, making it easier for players to find others without feeling the need to rely on external tools. While we don't have specific details to share at the moment, we recognize the importance of strengthening in-game tools to facilitate social connections and organize play. Our philosophy has always been to build systems that serve the community's needs while staying true to the spirit of organic, cooperative gameplay that Guild Wars 2 is known for. Um, so one of the big things about that is they mentioned the group finder. Um, in Guild Wars 2, the group finder is like this. You know, you can go to a section, uh, such as, you know, like I'm doing a, uh, I'm doing a, a raid right now, or I'm doing an Ice Brood Saga strike mission, and you go to that section and you make a group, and other people can find it and join. Um, you can compare that to like, your know, World of Warcraft has a group finder. You just say like, tank looking for dungeon, or healer looking for dungeon, or DPS, whatever. And they, if you get the queue to pop, it teleports you to that dungeon, forces you in the group, and just goes. Now, the latter example, the WoW example, is much easier to jump into groups, and it takes less effort, and you can go through parties without talking to people. Unfortunately, because it's so easy to get in, that also means that people are very quick to just kick people out of groups that they don't like, you know, without even any discussion, anything like that. Um, you know, act like jerks because they could just get, you know, jump back in the queue, uh, stuff like that. Um, and it definitely, in some ways, you know, just feels like you're stepping on a conveyor belt. You go through the dungeon and then you step off the conveyor belt. You know, it feels less social. I'm not saying that is a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just saying that having a dungeon finder system like that has cons it's sim it's not just all good things uh so it it just depends so I, i'm sure uh, at least i would assume that that's the kind of stuff that you know they're having conversations about to decide if they want that um okay question thank you so much for your time before signing off is there anything you'd like to say to veterans or new players alike about the future of guild wars Answer. Thank you for the opportunity. To both veterans and new players, the future of Guild Wars 2 is incredibly exciting, and we've, uh, we're committing to delivering new adventures, challenges, and experiences for everyone. For those who have been with us for years, we're constantly evolving the game to keep it fresh while honoring the elements that make Guild Wars 2 special, whether it's through expansions or quality of life improvements. Your continued support and feedback have shaped the game into what it is today, and we look forward to continuing that journey together. For new players, there has never been a better time to jump in. Guild Wars 2 has always embraced an inclusive player friendly philosophy that allows you to explore at your own pace while offering rich stories, epic battles, and a community that welcomes newcomers with open arms. Uh, we're committed to making sure that we expand. The game remains accessible and enjoyable for players of all skill levels. The road ahead is filled with opportunities for discovery, and we can't wait to see how you make your mark on Tyria. Now, that is a lot of very excellent salesman talk. He rolled a critical success, success with diplomacy and charisma there, uh, but I do want to basically plus one the stuff he said. Um, there's never been a better time to jump in. Either not just saying that. Um, the last time that they released their numbers, they had basically um, uh, broken their uh, previous all-time high record count of players. So Guild Wars 2, if anyone is watching this video and they're, they're not an active player of the game, if you're interested, play it. It's not a dead game. There is a huge population of people still active and playing on it. Um, it's not the same population as World of Warcraft or Final Fantasy XIV. It is a smaller developer, but it is an extremely healthy population, and it is doing just fine if you'd be interested in it. Uh, as far as, you know, export your own pace, 
the game has not raised the maximum level like ever so your stuff does not go you, you don't have to be like oh i have to get this gear and then the item level increases and now i gotta grind dungeons to get this gear and then the item level increases and then i gotta grind dungeons to get this gear like no if you come back to the game after like a year long break your stuff is if you were max level before you're max level after and you just got to get the rust off you know that that's it that's it uh and as far as like it, you know inclusivity to players and stuff like that i have I have played MMOs on and off since uh, April, I think, of 2000. Ruins of Kunark, EverQuest expansion. And I have legitimately never seen a nicer community. Now, obviously, every community has bad eggs. Most of ours are in PvP. There's a few outside of that. But uh, every community has bad eggs. But for the most part, if I go to map chat in World of Warcraft and I yell like, hey, how do I blah, 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 usually I find out how they've met my mother. Uh, in this game, if I go to map chat, I'm like, hey, can someone help me? I'm trying to find out. I usually get answers. And that's the simplest way of putting it. Like, the community in this game typically is like, oh, yeah, you just da 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 it's, it, it encourages good behavior. It's nice, folks. Um, lastly, Guild Wars 2 Janthier Wild still has three updates to come with story content in all of them. Players can expect a new raid in the next major update scheduled for November alongside two new map locations and the final two updates. Readers can also take a look at our detailed review of Guild Wars 2 Janthier Wilds, and then there's a link to their review uh, from Sportskita, which... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm new to the website. I had never heard of this until uh, someone on the subreddit was kind enough to post it. You know, who was it? Hang on a sec. Credit where credit is, too. Uh, looks like uh, Bob the Breaker. Bob the Breaker posted it. So thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. So yeah, that is it. And that is all the new news. Some very interesting thoughts. I, I love hearing about the stuff behind the scenes. I used to work in tech support myself, so uh, I, I often tend to have a different perspective um, f about some of these things. Like... <laughs> you know, like the, the yearly expansion cycle, things like that. Like I, I, I can understand how they might make a change and we might not see a lot of, a, a, you know, big impact from that. But I can look at that and be like, oh, wow, okay, that's going to shorten their workday a lot. That's extremely helpful on their side, you know, for development. Things like that. Um, but yeah, uh, if you've got any questions, problems, thoughts, concerns,